Hi YouTubers, this is Lonnie Clark again, that's for art. It's super late, I worked till late and then I made kombucha and then I brainstormed with someone about an idea that I have. And I'm going to read just a, a page or two, I don't know how long I'll be able to read to be honest, it's 1.30 in the morning uh, and I had a 9 o'clock appointment this morning so... But I want to read a little bit from Tamplin and Goffman, Population Control Through Nuclear Pollution. We're at Chapter 5, Lip Service to the Public Health. And um, I'll tell you about my idea, maybe after I read or maybe the next time I talk to you. So Chapter 5 is Lip Service to the Public Health. That's on page 52. This um, okay, the Lawrence Radiation Laboratory will soon be announcing radio iodine is good for babies, we were told by IF Stone's bi-weekly issue of June 24, 1963. The Atomic Energy Commissioners are back on the hot seat and something has to be done. We were also told by Dr. Stepford G. English, an assistant general manager of the Atomic Energy Commission in the spring of 1963. These words represented the basis for an exploration of the possibility of setting up the Lawrence Radiation Laboratory, a comprehensive long-range program of investigation of effects of AEC programs upon man and his ecosystems. Huh. Why were the AEC commissioners on the hot seat in 1963? Some 18 years after the establishment of the AEC through the Atomic Energy Act of 1946. Less than 20 years, the AEC was on the hot seat. That's my comment. What special effects signaled difficulties for the AEC? An answer requires brief consideration of the prior history of the atomic energy development. The LRL Biomedical Program and the Plowshare Program. Few controversies have been more thorough, the, few controversies have been more bitter throughout the world than which developed during the 1950s concerning the damaging effects upon humans of radioactive fallout from the nuclear weapon testing by superpowers. Excellent studies by Edward B. Lewis, Jack Schubert, Alice Stewart, and Linus Pauling, asterisk. Uh, what is the asterisk for? We'll see. Dr. Edward B. Lewis is a professor of biology, California Institute of Technology. Dr. Stuart, Dr. Jack Schubert is co-author uh, with Dr. Ralph E. Lapp of Radiation. What is it and how it affects you, New York? Viking Press, Inc., 1958. Dr. Linus Pauling is Nobel Laureate in Chemistry and Nobel Laureate in Peace. Currently, he is a professor in chemistry, Stanford University. Linus Pauling is the guy who discovered that vitamin C is like an antioxidant. If you guys have never read that book, you need to read his book about vitamin C. Just so you can Google it. It's awesome. Okay. Let's get back to this. Excellent studies by Edward B. Lewis, Jack Schubert, Alice Stewart, and Linus Pauling, and those of a host of geneticists, provided abundant reason for concern over possible irreversible and massive deteriorous effects upon present and future humans. Let's read that again provided abundant reason for concern over possible irreversible and massive deleterious effects upon present and future humans that the vast bulk of the work biological that the vast 
Oh, I'm sorry, this flips me out. I cannot read very easily. That the vast bulk of the work, that the vast bulk of the world, I cannot say the word, I apologize. That the vast bulk of the world, biological community, shared the same such leading scientists is well known. Few would doubt that this concern was the major influence in ultimately leading to the treaty to ban nuclear tests in the atmosphere, and that such concern led to the richly deserved award of a second Nobel Prize to the outstanding chemist, Linus Pauling, this time for his contributions to peace, is appreciated throughout the world. But unfortunately, a rational solution to the problem created by the radioactivity and radiation associated with atomic energy has not yet been reached. Indeed, as shall be developed here, the problem has been made much worse by the burgeoning of the, quote, peaceful, unquote, atom, which now bids fair to compete successfully with, quote, warlike, unquote, Adam, in creation of human misery, death, and even possible human genocide. The Pacific Genocide, like, oh man, okay. The decade of the 1950s saw the extensive testing of nuclear weapons in the atmosphere, on the sea and on land, primarily by the United States and the USSR. The Cold War was in full bloom, and prevailing philosophy was that life was only to continue as a balance of nuclear terror between superpowers. And the leading militarists of the superpowers, with scientists in collaboration, single-mindedly pursued the concept that survival was contingent upon one step or more ahead of potential enemies in the quantity, deliverability, and sophistication of nuclear weapons. This concept led directly to massive testing programs of such nuclear weapons. With the discovery that massive quantities of radiation substances, byproducts of nuclear explosions, were falling out virtually over the entire globe, being being concentrated in foodstuffs such as milk and thus entering the bodies of humans and numerous other species around the world, public indignation and fear, public indignation, fear, and concern grew. Such concern represented, such concern represented to thwart the continuation of the military program and therefore in the military mind required allying of the allying of the public fear <clears throat> in the united states this task fell to the atomic energy commission in particular its division of operational safety so far as can be ascertained the only contribution of this division or of the aec itself is in the area which, I'm sorry, or the AEE itself in the area was simply platitudinous reassurance. <laughs> you can tell this guy had a nail like, that's hilarious. <laughs> Let me read that again. So far as can be ascertained, the only contribution of this division or of the AEC itself in this area was simply platitudinous reassurance. It is hard, in retrospect, to have expected much more than reassurance, since the distribution by spewing of radioactivity into the biosphere we now know can hardly have to been expected to produce anything other than human misery and death. They know it causes human misery and death. The AEC's tranquilizers, excuse me, the AEC's tranquilizer technique. Early in this reassurance effort, the Atomic Energy Commission learned a temporarily useful technique in allaying the public fear. I'm sorry, that's called allaying the public fear. Assuming, assume some amount of radioactivity is safe, 
even though no evidence exists for such safety, and repeat over and over that amounts of radioactivity released have not exceeded the same amount. Perhaps the most amazing thing of all is that this supreme falsehood worked as a partial tranquilizer for as long as it did. It still does. As the concern of outstanding biologists grew, public fears grew, and no doubt there were major concerns, among others, that finally led President Eisenhower to a unilateral moratorium on atmospheric nuclear testing in 1957. Holy crap. The USSR also ceased nuclear weapons testing in the atmosphere. That means they were testing in the atmosphere when I was born? <laughs> Crap. But in 1961, the Soviet Union resumed large-scale nuclear weapons testing in the atmosphere. The United States quickly followed suit, and the radioactive pollution of our atmosphere mounted in 1962, even more insulting phenomenon of atmospheric testing within the continental U.S. at the Nevada test site was again carried out, both for national defense purposes and for the now infamous program known as the Plowshare, dedicated to developing, quote, peaceful, unquote, uses of nuclear explosives. Wow. By now, however, a modest sophistication concerning the long-distance spread of radioactivity from such tests has developed. Measuring stations were available to test for fallout of a variety of radioactive nuclides, including their appearance in such vital foods as milk. So that's why they don't do it anymore, because they did it at first and found out we're screwed. The next subtitle, Thyroid Cancer from Contaminated Milk. The state of Utah, hello, Kevin Blanche. <laughs> I'll take my glasses off for that. Hi, Kevin. The state of Utah has had, mer has been mer merciless. Let me start over. The state of Utah has been mercilessly clobbered by nearly all all such atmospheric tests in Nevada because prevailing winds generally carry the radioactive debris there. One radioactive substance released is especially pernicious, that known, that known as radioiodine. This radionuclide deposited on forge is taken up by what amounts to carpet sweep carpet sweeping actions by cows and concentrated in cow's milk. Infants and children drinking such radioiodine contaminated milk extract the radioiodine from the milk and concentrate this poison in the thyroid gland, a gland of very small size which has an affinity for iodine. The final result is intense irradiation of the thyroid gland by the radioactive decay of the radioiodine. As we have learned to our sorrow, radiation of the thyroid gland in children leads to one ultimate result, thyroid gland cancer, 15 years later. The Atomic Energy Commission, with characteristic aplomb, presumed that all the old cliches would work as they had before. Platitudinous reassurance. Its division of operational safety had ready for presentation its lullaby. The Atomic Energy Commission conducted nuclear explosive tests in Nevada. No harmful quantities of radioactivity were detected off-site. One needs to understand the AEC's concept of, quote, harmful, unquote, in order to appreciate this ludicrous statement so routinely dusted off and presented. When the AEC says radiation is harmless, it means they don't drop over dead by the droves as a result of exposure. 
As for the cancer or leukemia developing 10 or 15 years later, who'll know? Who'll ask? This is the harmless radioactive dose as the AEC sees it. But the situation in 1962 was different. A network of testing milk a network of testing milk for radioiodine existed and was in operation in the state of Utah. And as a result, the lies of the AEC concerning no harmful amounts of radioactivity being released in the Nevada test sites were quickly exposed. Limits, which we now know are by no means safe, prescribed by the Federal Radiation Council were in danger of being exceeded in Utah milk, and the state of Utah was in an uproar in seething it at with highly justifiable indignation indignation. And the Atomic Energy Commissioners heard plenty about the radioactive iodine contamination of Utah milk. So it's 16 minutes and 13 seconds. I just looked up at the time. I think I will stop. We're on page 56 and we'll resume at the first paragraph on page 56, chapter 5, Lip Service to the Public Health. And um, I don't know if this information didn't flip you out, but it woke me right up, and it's now 20 to 2. That really makes me angry. I mean, like, seriously? It makes me wonder what our elected officials are thinking. Those people that go to Washington that get debriefed, they must know the truth. I mean, it is an outrage that they're willing to let millions and millions of people what just get sick 20 30 years from now and no one will know it's them they can go to sleep their kids will inherit their money and life is good maybe their kids will survive wow this is some heavy information you guys like this is some seriously heavy stuff this is this is why fukushima happened this is exactly why Fukushima happened. And guess what? This is why me and you and everybody you know, we have to all like attend Helen Caldecott's seminars, go to seminars on the anti-nuclear movement and get them shut down. We cannot continue the bleeding. They've done enough damage. I mean, it has got to stop. That's, that's where the lies, that's where the real destruction of what everything we had in our culture was about was with the nuclear industry. And it is a serious, it's not just a threat to us, it's a threat to them. The nuclear industry themselves, they don't even realize, like I think they're just drunk with, I mean they're, com I, I haven't got a clue why anybody in the nuclear industry does not not believe that it's harmful. It doesn't take a rocket science to lay over a map of the nuclear, all the nuclear power plants, and then lay a map of cancer over it. And you will see uranium mines, nuclear power plants, and waste sites. And you lay that over a cancer map, and the two go together. It doesn't take rocket science. Uh, but as it turns out, the rocket scientists know that radiation is very harmful for you. All radiation, there's no safe limit. There is no self. That's a complete falsehood. Wow. I gotta stop. So I'm gonna come back and read tomorrow night, hopefully not at 1 30 in the morning. <laughs> so bye, you guys. Sweet dreams. Keep your courage up. Put your courage feet on because we need it and we need to be cheerful and not hateful. How about that one? Like, we need to be the. What did Gandhi say? Be the change you want to see? So that just means it takes more effort to be peaceful. It takes more effort. But you know what? For some reason we're here and I guess it's our effort to make. So 